raise them to some power and get more coordinates. And then you get some polynomial fit instead of some linear fit. And you can create some polynomial curve that's going to go through all of these data points exactly. And in this case, the error is going to be zero. Right? If you make the polynomial so it's larger. Right? So, so, so this second curve seems like uh, maybe this one's a better fit. Um, it has, has zero error on this data. Right? I mean, isn't there a complexity limit? Things tend to be simpler then. Right. Uh, right. So, the, 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 you know, the, the thing you should be balancing is like Occam's razor. Um, Occam's razor, I, you know, I, um, um, so, um, I'm not sure what a razor is, but I've never heard this in any other part of, of life. But I was, I was taught that, you should remember this as KISS, um, keep it um, simple, um, stupid. Right, so come, right? So is, it, is, it, is this is this only something that my high school physics teacher taught me or other people have heard this? Okay. So you should keep a model kind of as simple as you can. But if but it's sometimes, especially with really large data sets, you want a more complex model. There is something more complex going on. So how do you how do you trade off a smaller amount of error virtu um, versus a simpler model? How do you figure out what is the right in between there, right? There's not, I mean, like there's, there's, there's no right answer or wrong answer, right? So, um, the, the, um, the, 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 like the, the kind of accepted way of doing this is called cross uh, validation. And so, so people have maybe heard of heard of cross validation. Um, yeah, I've heard of it. But I was just going to say when I, I took the uh, that online Stanford uh, 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 machine learning class, and, and one of the linear regression, one of the things out of the linear regression algorithm we wrote is when you overfit, you, you don't want to. The good thing about algorithms is that they're good at predicting what what's going to come next. And if you overfit, then it's really bad at predicting or, and getting it correct. So it's, right, right. Um, but yes, I have heard of cross validation. Okay. If you uh, comment, okay. So you you had also heard of cross validation, right? So so cross validation is kind of telling you um, exactly what like what you were saying. Um, which model is better at predicting what's going to come next? Next. And so what you do is you take your data set and you break it into two parts. Um, so some R and um, and and S. Right, so your, your data set is the union of these two, and, and also our um, intersect S is an empty set, right? So, so these are disjunct. So you have two separate parts of your data set, okay? And then what you do is you build a model, um, model M on R. Um, so R is, um, so R is going to be the training data, and S is going to be the test um, data, right? So, so you build this model on R, and then you're going to um, um, you're going to test um, the model on on um, on S, right? So you're going to have some sort of loss function. Um, and you're going to measure R versus this data S. This model builds on R with this data S. Okay, and so your goal is to make this loss as small as possible. Okay, so um, so the, what that means is that goes into how you build the model. So your model your model can be more complex. That can mean um, more polynomial parameters in the fitting here, or it could be that your your um, we'll, we'll look at this in terms of uh, um, in terms of say ridge regression of the lasso, where you have this parameter this this uh, s parameter that says um, how much are you how much are you um, regressing to the mean, 
right? So, um, so let's recall that here. So, in in the ridge regression, you can build a model R. So the the model in this case was okay. So the, so what was the problem here? You had um, you had it um, you had a data set P. Okay, let's sorry. Let's let's say the um, the loss function of a of a of an A and a data set P is going to be the sum over P of um, the point set minus. Um, so you had the sorry you had the y coordinate of the point minus the sum of, of j equals one to d of e, um, aj times um, pj squared, right? So you're taking this least squares estimate. You built this model, which was these coefficients a, right? And so then if, if this is this just the least squares cost, um, you can solve this by saying a is, is going to be equal to, um, let's call this part of the data, um, xp was x transpose xp inverse x transpose of p, um, x of p transpose times y, right? So you could solve for this exactly like this, right? Um, so this was a loss function, but if you did the um, ridge regression, you had this extra s parameter um, then you had this extra s parameter and this um, uh, um, where you you uh, you want to minimize these coefficients. You want these coefficients not to be too big. And the larger the s parameter, the smaller you require the coefficients to be. Where if s was zero, then you know it was just the least square solution, right? If s is large, then it's it's going to be all the coefficients are are approaching zero. Okay, and so you could plug, um, you just had to plug this S squared inside of this, this term here and you could still solve this. And so now this would be the solution A of S. Okay, so, so then what you want to do, you want to build this model on R. Um, so, so you build this model um, A R of S. And then you want to um, and so you can do this by x of r transpose x of r um, plus s squared inverse x of r transpose y of r, right? So you can build this model, and then you want to test this model on your set s. So now you're going to evaluate this loss function. Um, and so you can evaluate the loss function using this model A of R of S. Um, I shouldn't have picked S here. Let me use T. I did want to keep that S. Okay. And you want to evaluate this on, on this data S. Right, so now you're going to look at the least squares cost on only this test. Oh, sorry. On, o, on only the test data that you did not build the model. Right, so if you're when you're testing how good you did on your own data, right, you're going to end up in a situation like this. I'm going to get zero error. You're going to fit exactly to it. Right, so 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 you're you can you can you can get the error to be to be artificially small. So you shouldn't test on your own data. You should test on the data that you've held out. Okay. So the whole idea behind this really goes back to this, 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 this model here where you have, let's see, if you have this, this process mu which is creating your data set P. And you really want to think your data is coming from you you want to evaluate how well it will do if you got, you know, more data from you, which you haven't gotten, right? So the whole point is not to do.
do well on the existing data because you already know the answer to the existing data. Your goal is to build a function which will do well on other data which is trapped inside you, you haven't gotten to it. Or the patients you haven't observed yet. The part of Twitter that is not in your 1%. How do you do well on that part of your data? Right, so, so when you're testing on the data you held out, the T is, so because this is a process, and if you've done this, you've split, um, um, if you split randomly, then that means that mu has also generated um, your test data T. Right, so you've used some of your data to build a model, and you've, but you've also got a fresh set of data which is coming directly from your process. And so you can test on this and evaluate here. So now I've, I've only done this once. I picked one value S and I went and I tested it. But I want to minimize this over all values S. So the, the goal is to return the, um, the model which is going to be the R min of A R S of L of the loss of R S R T. Right, so you're going to look over all models where you fix, um, you fix um, R and T, fix the split, then you know find the best model on R. And what you're varying is this parameter s. So, so, so you're varying this parameter s, and you're trying to minimize this loss function. So you don't necessarily want to have this, this uh, regularization term when you're minimizing here. This was a guide to select a model which is better. And so if you if you do this, I, I spent some time trying to convince you that it was worthwhile to do something like this ridge regression, where you had this extra parameter S here. Um, so, um, okay. So, well, where you had this extra parameter S here, you said the the least squares is when you have zero here, and that really fits your data. Well, if you look and you try and minimize this with the test data, you're going to do better on the test data for some probably non-zero parameter of S. Okay, so, okay, so how do you minimize this over S? Okay, well, uh, let me ask you again. If I instead was doing, if I was instead doing a lasso, how do I minimize this over S? Remembers how we calculated the solution for lasso on Monday. Okay, who remembers the general process? How does this process work? How does the high-level idea work? How do we how do we start to come up with the with the solution? So we're actually working with this dual parameter t, but there was this, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence with every value t and one value s. So we can take the output for every value t, but what we did is we started with the value of t of zero, and we incrementally, we gradually increased this, right, this, this value t, until that things were no longer changing as we increased it. And at every stage there was a linear there was a linear equation of how this A of R of S um, varied as we, as we moved from one breakpoint to the next. And there are a bunch of these things where it was linear in between these steps. The model changed, the coordinates changed in a linear fashion in between. So when we solved the lasso using um, least single regression, we had, we had all possible solutions. We had solved for all of them. And because it's linear, you can, you can actually solve for the minimum, given 
a test that you've held out, you can actually solve for a minimum value as you're doing it. And so um, I, I, I believe this is built into the proper software if you were to use it. The one of the benefits of this uh, of the lasso is that as you as you as you're running this, you know you're not just finding one solution, but you, you can also um, cross validate while you're doing it and find the optimal value of S or the optimal value of little t in, in, in the process. So it seemed painful to have to go through them all, but you really, if you're doing cross validation correctly, you should have been going through them all um, in the first place, right? So, so, so that you should view that as a benefit, not actually a pain of, of going through it. Okay, so, okay, now if we're doing, if we're doing the, the ridge regression instead of the lasso, how do we solve for the right value? Can we do it explicitly? Because can't you write it down in the matrix form? I haven't seen that. Um, as, um, it's possible. If, if, if you can show me that, or I would be interested to see that. So, uh, so I was I was more thinking of a, more of a scientific computing way of doing. It. So, who here is like a scientific computing person? So, there's, there's got to be someone here in like the CES program, right? Who's who sits in this building? Right. You, you got to be assigned to the computing field, right? No? A little bit, right? Okay. So how would, how would you solve for, how would you minimize an equation over one frame? Well, <laughs> so you the question how, how do you minimize over a function of one frame? Right. Isn't this the central question yeah, of scientific computing? Yeah. So you you have the loss here, yeah. and you want to minimize some um, some some function, right? Okay. So if you could write down the equation, you could take the derivative and say well, the zero, and you would get these minimal points. And maybe this is the solution that you're you're, you're pointing to. So if that's possible, then that's great. If not, you can try and search this using you can try the gradient descent. You can try this with random restarts, you can do something um, on like going ratio search or something like that, right? This all sounds yeah. like I'm on the right track. Uh, yeah, it all sounds like the stuff that I learned in Mike's class. Okay, okay, good. Okay, so I'll, I'll, if I talk to if I see Mike, I'll tell him that you you, you had some big illusion of what you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, so there's there's a family of techniques for finding the minimum and the function. So I, um, I I haven't seen a guarantee that this is going to be convex, so that there's going to be one minimum. There there could be some local minimum here. Um, so you may need to use some techniques to find it. But you can you can search here. And one thing you know is that this function cannot increase too quickly. Right. So if you if you move a small amount, um, so if it's, well, it's got this least squares part, so. So, okay, so, I'm um, kind of going off script here, but um, if you're close to the solution, it, sh it shouldn't move too, too quickly, you should be able to, Pick a bunch of, of points of S and try all these points on like a grid, and one of them will probably give you a pretty, um, pretty decent solution. And then you can try some local methods like gradient descent um, to, to try and find some local optimum, and this will give you a pretty good solution. So, so the, the I wouldn't focus too much on getting the exact solution here. You want to get something which is approximately good. I mean. If one solution gives you 
an answer here, and a different value has, gives you another answer, and the losses are very close to each other. I wouldn't say this one is the right one and this one is the wrong one. They're both probably good. There's some randomness here in how big your, your, how big your test set is. Right? So if your test set was larger or was different, then it could have been that, you, that this function changed and this one was actually lower than this one. So don't take any of this hard too much. Don't worry about solving for the exact solution. Anything approximately optimal is probably going to be just as good. Um, okay, so, so th this kind of touched on another issue with the cross-validation as I've described it, in that I've taken my data set and I've split it into these two parts. If I split it differently, I may have got a different solution. Right? I'm testing on these data points, but not on these data points. And maybe there was something important here that I missed in my test set. Right. And also, when I've, and, and another problem is that when I've taken part of my training data and given it to my test set, I have less data to build a model with. I wanted to build a model with my data, um, but in some, some ways, I've, I'm not using all of my data. I'm kind of using it to figure out what the value rest is, right? So I'm still kind of using it, but maybe I could have used more of the data more wisely. So, so, so what's, the, what's the standard way to kind of do better with the same amount of data? What? Well, I was going to say, um, just take like, so you have your, your, your entire bucket of data, just take a small subset for the training and then, or a small subset for the validation and then um, the rest for the, for the training. Uh, I don't know if that's the standard, but. So if you take a too small of a subset for the test data, then it means that when you're evaluating this, you're evaluating it based on your test data. So this function may be a lot more, may be different than it should have been. It's a worse representation of mu if your test data is small. Can, can they overlap? If you overlap, then you may be fitting to a particular outlier data point. Um, and then you're also testing on that outlier data. So you, you, you don't want to test on the same data you train on. What if you use, for your, for your training, what if you use the entire, the, the entire thing for, for, for training, but then for your subset, or uh, for your test, you just grab random points. Um, would, that, would that skew it too much, or you just grab like? So I'm essentially grabbing some random points because I split this randomly to hold out and I don't want to train on these data points. Okay, so you, you, you've been kind of uh, looking at me, Jeff, so well, you, well, well, you're looking at me like you know what the answer is that you're waiting to say. Couldn't you, couldn't you just randomly sample from your data and then get, get the best coefficients and then just keep on, you know, bootstrapping it? Okay, yeah, good, so, uh, uh, so I'll get to bootstrapping next. Um, but so bootstrapping is slightly different, and, and, and I'll, I'll get to that next. So, okay, so, so the, the answer I'm looking for um, with the vague question I gave, so I, I don't entirely blame you, is um, on this k-fold cross-validation. Um, um, so what you do is you take your, your data set P and you break it into P1, P2, up to PK, um, where um, um, for all PIJ, I not equal to J, PI um, and PJ are disjoints, right? So, so you're breaking this up into K disjoint sets. And then what you do is you run um, uh, validation on uh, where you have uh, R equals to P uh, not equal to I and T equals to PI. Right? So you're doing this um, for all 
Uh, so you, so R, your train set, is all of the subsets except for the one you say for your test. And the one that you tested on is everything else. But you do this for all I, and then you kind of take the average of it, right? You're averaging out these functions. So instead of, so then you solve for this value S here, but you're taking the sum of these functions, and you want to minimize the sum of these. And so now, every one of your data points is going to be in the training data, right? So you're getting a much better representation of mu, and, and you're, and I'll, you're always using most of the data for the, I mean, it's always in your test data, sorry, spoke in. And most of your data is in the training data, too. So not only are you testing on all of your data, you're also, every model you build, you're doing the training with, is on most of your data. And you're always keeping your, your testing data and your training data set. Um, so sometimes, you know, this is, the, 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 the larger you make K, the more expensive this is, because you need to refit this, this uh, training process. And in the, in the limit, um, as, as K equals um, the size of your data set, right, then this is called L equal O, which is leave one out cross validation. Right, so you're leaving out one data point, building model and everything else, and then you're testing on that one data point, and then you can average over all these things. Um, so, so, but this can be very expensive because then you're building, if you have n data points, you're building n different models entirely. Sometimes you can reuse some of the data and do this efficiently. Um, so the, the, the biggest problem with this is generally the, how it's, it's, it's inefficient to do it. And there's some issues, sometimes you split up the data in a weird way, sometimes because you're, your test data is small each individual time, you're somehow not working correctly, and then which model do you actually use in that? Here, I was able to get a model out, but when you're doing this, you're just getting a parameter S out. I guess you could then go and run, uh, build a model on all the data with that parameter S, and, and hope that that works out. Um, but there's some small kind of, uh, kind of issues there. Maybe you'd even leave out other data to go build your model on afterwards. Um, once you found the right parameter s. And, and this parameter s could have been the, the polynomial in your model of at least fit. It could have been any other parameter in your algorithm. Right. So, so a lot of the algorithms we talked about in all of the class have had some parameter. Like k means clustering had a parameter, right? It was k. Right? Um, so like a lot of these, uh, of, of, of the different algorithms, like the, the PCA, we need to know how many of the singular values to take. That was a parameter. How do you know which ones you should take, which ones are nodes? The stuff that you're not picking up in PCA is the nodes. Right, so at, at what point do you not build a richer model versus, um, you know, versus classifying the rest as nodes? So you can use this for any single parameter. When you have multiple parameters, the search space just becomes harder. Right, so if you ask Aditya, Know, who, who learned so much from Mike's class. He'll tell you that searching a two-parameter space for the minimum is much harder than a one-parameter space, right? And if you had 10 parameters, it'd be even worse. Good. Thanks. Oh, lots of matrix competition. Okay. Uh, good, good. So, um, right, so, 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 so if you want to learn a parameter, this is, you know, this is kind of the accepted statistical way of, of, of doing it. some form of cross-validation, whether it's some version of the k-fold or the leave one out. The k-fold can be more expensive than just having a training data and a test set. And I still see lots of papers that just kind of break it up once and, and run this, and that, that's their solution, and it's, it's okay. Um, but if, you, you know, if you're gonna really look into it and try and do the best, this is probably going to give you a better answer. Um, if your data is big enough, you know, we, we talked about the very beginning of class, how many data points you needed to kind of approximate some distribution when they're drawn at random. And we're assuming that T is coming out of this distribution at random, and there's some trade-off where you can give some, something like, um, 
something like epsilon um, uh, relative error with one over epsilon squared samples. Right, so there, there's something that looked like this. It just tailored to slightly different problems a little bit differently, and there's different coefficients that go in front there. But if you want, say, 1% error, then train set needs to be something like um, something like 10,000. Right? If you want 10% error, then you need 100. Right? So um, that's maybe one way to keep in mind. A lot of these these problems with really big data big data problems, if you're looking at something where the relative error is, is, is good, that means something talking about with respect to the entire data set, not with respect to the individual person, then you can probably just split it up into a train set and test set, and you may have 10,000 data points lying around you're happy to save for the test set, and that's going to be fun. And you still have plenty to train. Um, but if you have much smaller amount of data, and it's more precious, then you want to do something like capable of cross-validation. And that's that's actually corresponds well because this is going to take longer, but if you don't have that much data, then okay, you can just, just run it for longer, but it'll still probably finish in some amount of time. Okay. Um, okay, so the other thing I was gonna mention uh, um, was bootstrapping. So let me Right, this here. So bootstrapping is related to is related to cross validation. Um, so what we do for bootstrapping is you take P and you generate a set Q from P. And Q is not a subset. So Q is going to have the property that um, that the size of Q is going to be equal to the size of P, and and each Q is drawn proportional to P. It's drawn uniformly from P um, with uh, replacement. So if you don't do it with replacement and they're the same size. Right, that means that you're just going to get the same set back, right? But you have to do it with replacement. Each one is randomly. So some points are going to be picked twice. Some points are not going to be picked. On average, you get like 63% um, of the points, I think is the number, or something like that, of the, of the distinct points. And then some number of those are duplicates, some number of them occur a few times. And we looked at, um, you know, when we, 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 we looked at the distribution of how many things occur multiple times earlier, beginning of the semester. Um, then what you do is, and you do this for QI, and then you get some um, some set. This is a, a, a um, this is a calligraphic Q, you can't tell. Um, and so you get these um, these sets. Um, Q, uh, T, so this, this set of them. And what you do is you build a model, um, model I, that's built on um, um, some, some algorithm that you have on each of these data sets. And you can get the set of these T models. And this will allow you to assess how much, how much variance, essentially, you have in the process that builds your model. The key thing, whenever any form of cross-validation, the training set was always less, a size less than the, than the full data set. And so, so we, you want to know how much, um, how much error you have when you're building on all of your data. Um, how certain are you of that data set? And it may depend also on the distribution of the type of things in your data set. Right, so, okay, so you have this distribution of these models, this may be hard to understand. But if you think of it as a single model, like you're looking at one dimensional data and you're taking the mean. So each of these points is a mean of a, of a sample uh, with replacement. And then you can see how much variance there is in the estimate of the mean. 
And this assumes that, that P is drawn um, so that it's assumed that each P in P is drawn uh, from, you know, from some, some distribution P. So assume there's one distribution that all these points are drawn from. Okay? And, and so then if, if depending on what this, how this data is coming in, you can look at the distribution of these means. So you could get a plot, you know, of, you, you can make like a, um, like a histogram or some sort of density estimation of what the value of the mean of your data is. Right, so if your data is probably much more spread out, the mean will be more concentrated than the data, but it still may have these outliers. You still may have some chance that the mean is out here. It could have been that you had one data point which was really far away from everything else, and whenever you included that data point, the mean was somewhere out here. When you didn't include it, the mean was over here. So it could be that the mean has high variance, and this is why the mean is not known as a robust estimator. If you look at this with the median, you'll see that it's going to be much, um, much tighter in here, although the median may be more, um, more jumpy. It may be at a bunch of um, kind of these different locations instead of something more smooth. Um, but so this is a way of seeing how robust an estimator is, or how much variance there is in a the, the certain estimate, is using this bootstrapping. And this is very related to cross validation. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's not designed in the same way to pick out your parameter S. You're not testing on some of the data. You're just kind of uh, seeing the, the variance in your model. Now, if your model is more complicated, if your model is some sort of, of, of linear, linear estimator, you're going to get a set of these different lines. And understanding the set of these lines is, a, is going to be kind of a, is a, is a harder process. It's a harder thing to conceptually understand. Um, if you're interested, I can discuss some stuff with you afterwards. But it's kind of some. I've heard a lot of people talk about how do how do you think of representing these things in a way that makes sense. And I've got some some partially technical, but some I think uh, good ways of looking at this. Okay.